Okay, let's go back to plotting with R. R is really, really strong at plotting. It's one of the most important things of R next to the statistical capabilities and all the, the, the models and methods it can use. Plotting is really in the core. And if you look at the description on their web page, they say they are a statistical framework for statistical and visual whatever thing. So visualization is very important. And the way that visualization works in R is that you have a so-called device on which you do your plotting. And in R Studio, this little box down here when you plot is your device. Let's say I plot 1 through 10. Then it opens here plots, and this is the so-called device on which it plots. You can actually open new devices on Unix. I use the X11 windowing system. I just say X11, which will open a new device here. Then I have two devices, this one and this one. And now if I plot, then it will plot. Let's plot something that looks different. It has 20, then it will plot on this new device, on the actually currently open device. If I close this and plot again, then it goes back to this device. So it has kind of a list of devices. Uh, and those devices are important for us because there are devices that are called, for example, PDF. You can open a PDF device, plot to your PDF device, close it, and what it does, it plots actually into a file and it's a PDF, right? Or a PNG or a JPEG or other things. Okay, let's look at this here. It says here the devices are X11 for window for, for my window window on my Unix. If you use a Mac, then this device is called Quartz because that's the visualization engine that, that Apple operating systems use. If you have Windows, then you say Windows and it will open a new Windows device and you can plot on it. If you open a PDF device, you need to give it a file name. It will write a PDF file, a PNG, there's JPEG, there's TIFF, there's all kinds of graphics for SVG for, for vector graphics that it can um, write to. Um, if you open a device like this then, and you want to close it and, and it's not a device that actually makes a Windows like PDF, then you would do it the following way. Let's look at this. So I say X11. And if I want to close it again, I would just say device off. And it's a function. And then the device is gone and it goes back to its device that it had before, which is the RStudio GD device, which is this one over there. OK, sounds very, very technical. But fortunately, we don't need to work with it that much. All we need to do is say PDF and it's going to make a PDF for us. OK, there's three different levels at which you can do plotting. There's High-level plotting functions, and that's the ones that you want to use. For example, the function plot is a high-level plotting function. You give it data, it makes the visualization. Um, there's lower-level ones. For example, if you want to add something to a plot. For example, you want to add some piece of text somewhere, or you want to like add an arrow somewhere. right? Those are low-level plotting functions where you can define, I want an arrow from this coordinate to that coordinate. And I want to put a piece of text at this coordinate. And then the last one are interactive plots, where you can, with your mouse, interact with the plot, like the 3D plots where you spin them around, or where you can like zoom in, or things like that. And the basic graphics, they're all in the so-called base module, which is the base of R. But there's also advanced graphics sub systems like Grid, which we might, or ggplot, which we might talk a little bit about. High-level plotting usually uses generic functions like plot, and then you give it some data, and then plot will decide, depending on what data you give it, what the visualization should be. If it's just values, then it will do a scatter plot. If you have two variables, then it will assume the first one is x, the second one is y, it will make a scatter plot. If you give it a data frame, then it will assume that what you want is a scatter plot matrix, and it will make a scatter plot matrix, right? Okay. Let's look at this one. This one plots 1 through 10. So the same thing that we did here. It plots 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to 10. But the type here is line. That's why it's not little dots, but a line. Then we say the color is supposed to be red, and the line width, LWD, is supposed to be 3. That's why it's a little heavier than the other lines. And then you can use another high-level plotting function, which is called AB line, which can make horizontal and vertical lines. And in this call I say V for vertical, 5, which is I want a vertical line at position 5. Vertical is here, that's position 5, right? And I want to give it the line type 2. The default line type is 1, which is just a, an unbroken regular line. 
line type two is a broken line. Line type three is, uh, I guess, a line with dots or something. And line type four is dot, dash, dot, dash, and so forth. So you can make different line types important. If you print stuff black and white, colors don't help you so much, right? So then you use different line types to distinguish lines. OK, how do you get help for plot? Unfortunately, if you see question mark plot, the help that you get is very, very limited. And the reason is plot is a generic function. It's kind of like a placeholder that says other people will implement a plot for numbers, a plot for a data frame, a plot for a matrix, which means that it doesn't have all the arguments that you really use normally. And the plot function that actually has those is the so-called default function, plot.default. That's the default implementation for plot. And if you say question mark plot.default, then you will get all the parameters that that uh, plot has. So let's do this, plot.default. And then you will get here a description. And you see there's log for logarithmic scales and type for line type and main and sub and all kinds of things, right? And it has a description of what those do. OK, let's go back here. There is additional parameters for plotting that you can use that are not arguments of plot, but that actually change how the device works. And those are all collected in something called PAR, P-A-R. And you can do question mark P-A-R, and it will tell you things like you can decide what the margin is supposed to be on top and on the bottom of your plot. It, uh, you can tell it if it's supposed to do several plots on one page and so forth. So it, it, it defines how you uh, change your, your, or how your graphical device works. And it also has a list of things that you can actually pass onto plot, which is that you want your labels not to be written like this, but like sideways or something like that. So that's all in bar, and you can do question mark bar. And the best way to work with this is if you know that it has something to do with your labels, open the help page and look for the keyword label in there. Because this the bar uh, help page is like, 300 pages long, not really 300 pages long, but if you want to scroll down, it's going to take a while. Let's look at that. So this is bar, and this is like how much stuff is in there. So if you want to do something with labels, then you just say here, I guess, label, and hopefully, well, that's not how it works, label. How do you search in this thing? <laughs> label. So. And then you see, for example, here it says sex.label, and then says it's the magnification factor for labels, which means if on your printout the labels are too small, you, then you can increase this magnification factor and it will make the labels just larger. Or if they're too large, you can make it a number smaller than one and it will just like make them smaller. OK, so far so good. So that's bar. That's for fine tuning how your graphs will look like. And Let's now go to the next one, scatter plot. We need a scatter plot. This is just a bivariate normal distribution that has no correlation whatsoever. Uh, and I just choose random normal distributed variable for x, 500 points, 500 points for y. They have no relationship with each other. I say my uh, 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 label for the x-axis is supposed to be x. That's why there's an x down here. My label for my y-axis is supposed to be y. So that's why there's a y here. And the main is supposed to be bivariate normal distribution. That's why it's both a t uh, plot here. If you say sub for a sub uh, title, then it would probably put it down here or in the second line here, depending on, on the plot. Um, you could make x and y logarithmic scale if you want. There's an argument called log for logarithmic scale and so forth. And this is probably the default plot that, that one would expect if you have two vectors of numbers that are coordinates uh, to do this. If you have a data frame like iris and you say plot to iris, then you get this, and we saw this before, the Scatter plot matrix. And in addition, I added here the color parameter, which print uh, plot understands. And I use the name of the flower as the argument for the color parameter. And it will basically take this nominal variable, will convert it into numbers, and then convert those numbers into colors. One is black, two is red, three is green, four is blue, I guess, five is yellow. And since we have only three, it only uses the first three colors that it has, has defined. OK, so that's not hard. Histograms, we looked at histograms, right? 
So you say histogram, it's another high level plot. You give it one variable and it will make this histogram. And then there's one important variable uh, argument called breaks, which just tells you in how many pins does it break down um, your histogram. <coughs> the histogram has here a frequency or counts. Unless you say probability is true, then it changes and shows you the density here. You see it's not counts anymore, it's a density. Once you have a density, then you can actually use a density estimate on the same variable and plot the estimated density, which is uh, the estimate of the empirical density function that we talked about last time, uh, which kind of like smooths out those. You see there's a big dip here, and this kind of like smooths it out a little bit. And I said I want the cow to be red, and I actually use the high-level plotting function, which is called lines, which takes whatever density does. Density actually just creates values for the density here and uses the plotting function line to make this kind of, kind of line. Images. You can have a matrix and just use image on a matrix and you will get this image here. The default is uh, using heat colors, which is from white to red, where white is, I guess, the hottest and red is the coolest or red supposed to be the hottest, but it doesn't really matter because we have no idea if it uses one for very high numbers or the other for very low numbers. Uh, we know that this is a volcano, which is a mountain, so we know that the white is probably a very, very high value, very high elevation, and dark red is the lowest one. Um, I always get confused with those color scales, so it always makes sense to figure out, look at the matrix, there's a very low value here, and it corresponds to this color, so I know that that is the low color. There's lots of different color schemes. There's topical, which goes from blue for water to green, all the way to like white for mountaintops or something. Uh, and then there's at least five other kind of like color schemes how you can color those images. And we know images help us to see um, the values in the matrix, right? You could also just look at the matrix as numbers, but this encodes each position in the matrix as one little pixel and shows us that there's lots of large values kind of lumped together here. Uh, we can also use contours instead, right? And since this is already a mountain, this volcano data set, we just see it looks like a map, right? It just has elevation lines. It starts here with 110 and goes all the way up to 190 here. This piece is the highest piece of, of our volcano, which was this like white thing here. You can even overlay your contours over this thing and then you will have, have both on it. You can use a perspective plot for that, which looks cool but is not very helpful because I don't think that you can really see very much about this. I think this plot and this plot is way more useful for us than, than this cool like 3D mesh, mesh thing. Okay, what are typical arguments for plotting? Typical arguments for plotting is add. And add, if you call a plot function and then call another plot function, it will delete whatever the first plot function did and just make its own plot, right? But if you give it the f argument add and true, then it will overplot over the other one. So you can, for example, if you want one plot, which might be the volcano, right? And then you would say here for contours and say add is true, then it would add the contours on top of the image and you would get, I guess, a pretty good visualization, right? Okay, the next is axis. You can say axis by default is true, but you can say axis is false and then you will not get those axes, they will just be not plotted. Which for this picture here probably makes sense because if this is really a map, then one and zero don't really make any sense unless they are like longitude and latitude and I think they are not. So you would say axis is false and it would just like omit those axes and just show you the picture. Then you can do logarithmic scale. You can say logarithmic is x, is y or x and y and then we'll just use those axes to be logarithmic. There's a function type which tells you, do I want dots, do I want lines? Um, and in this case, if you say type is L, then you will get lines. Default is, is you get those little circles, right? Then labels, we already looked at that, X label, Y label, main title and subtitle. Almost all plot functions have those in common. And now let's go to the low level plot functions. You cannot use low level plot functions unless you used first a high level plot function. So you create a plot and then you can use those. Points adds points to the high level plot. So if you have an additional one point or several points then you can give it just X and Y 
and it will just add those points and you can maybe color them differently than the original points to kind of like show two groups or something like that. Lines adds lines, x and y coordinates. You need at least two x and two y coordinates, a starting point and an end point. If you have more, then it will make several lines. Text adds the text that you put in the label. You need to tell it x and y coordinates where the text is supposed to be placed. And there's additional arguments where you can see I want it actually exactly centered on the coordinate that I give you. I want it to the left on top or something. So there's all kinds of other things that you can see here. Polygon makes a polygon, right? Legend, you can add a legend which will make a box and say, I don't know, the dashed line means profit and the, com uh, the, the, the solid line means cost or something. So you can, you can do this here as well. And you can add the title later on main title and subtitle, and you can lay down add axis. And that's my, sometimes interesting because you have the original data, you plot it, you don't want the original axis, but you want to add different axis later on. For example, if I had this data here, and I would print it without the axis and lay down add an X that actually has really longitude and latitude correctly displayed, then that would be something that, that you, could, you could do. Okay. This bar that we looked at with question mark bar has lots of arguments that have something to do with the plotting device. And sometimes you want to change, for example, the margin on top or on the bottom of your plot. And the way that you would do it is you would call the function par and tell it what you want to change. For example, here, I want to change for my plotting device that the default color is four and the default BCH is the plotting character, is the type, if it's a circle or a triangle or whatever the, my points are, is supposed to be four. After I call this here, my device knows that I want color four, which is probably blue or something, and those kinds of plots. And whatever I plot will be using this definition. Till I reset it, and I can reset it by saying par, please use my old parameters, which this par function passes back here. And that's important, never change your par without resetting it afterwards. Because it might mess up all the other plots that you plot later on, because it will use those specifications. If you write a function that uses par and then plots and then ends the function, please before you exit your function, reset the old uh, plotting parameters. If you don't, then the person afterwards that plots something will be very unhappy because their plots will probably be mess messed up. Okay, how can you fix that in here if you actually wanna do this? Let's plot one through 10 and then let's say par, what color is red. And then I plot again, then this is red, but even it's worse because it made this box red, so that's really bad. And no matter how much I plot, I will always have this, right? So I wasn't smart enough to save the old value for color, which probably would just be color is black or something. But here it's easy because you can see clean all, and I think that will reset your device, hopefully. Yes, so my device is now set back, so it, it deleted whatever I had stored in, in par. Okay. So if this acts up and says, for example, the margins are too large and you can't plot anymore, just push clear all, it will make sure that the device gets back to a state that, that works, hopefully. Okay. Important parameters that bar has. It's the plotting character that goes from zero to 25. And zero is the default, is the circle. Uh, and there's 25 different ones, you can Google P, C, H, and R, and you will get a table that shows you, you can get a cross, you can get a little dot, you can get all kinds of, kinds of things there. LTY is the line type. The default is a solid line, but you can have dashed lines, dotted lines, all kinds of other lines. Line width, uh, then the color of things that you plot. CEX is the character expansion factor. So if you wanna make the title larger, then you would do this. If you wanna make the, the axis larger than the four, and then there is MAI for margin in inches. There's also an MAR for margin in rows, which a row is defined as the height of a character. And you can define them, the default is, let's see what the default is. Bar, oops, I probably need to do this. The default is 1.3 inches on the bottom here, 1.09 inches to the left, 1.09 on the top and half an inch to the right. And it's measured from this box. And unfortunately, 
It doesn't say that this is bottom, this is left, this is top, this is right. I just do this for so long that I know it. But if you look up question mark bar, it will tell you I have my first bottom left and right. So for example, if you want to have more space over here, then you could do this very easily. You could just say, how about, uh, how do I say this? I guess I say this like this is, let's make this two inches, two inches, two inches, and zero inches over there. And then it probably says that this, this is too small or something. Target of assignment expands to, I, probably the syntax is kind of like this. Okay, that's how it wants it. And now we plot, and then we see that our margins are totally messed up, right? Because I made such big margins, and that's obviously not what we want. I did not save the original margins, so I could either use those values if I know them, or I just say clean all and it will fix the margins again, and the next time it's again by the default. Margins can be important because sometimes your labels are so long that they kind of like get out of the picture, right? And if you still want them to be readable, then you have to increase the margin and, and kind of like do that so that, that your labels fit in there. Okay, plotting. You open a device of the file type that you want. You give it a file name. For example, I want to create a PNG file. And the file is supposed to be called plot.png. Then I just plot whatever I want. I have all my high level and low level plotting commands here. And then I say device off. And then I will find in my current working directory a file called plot.png that has exactly this print uh, printed on. I think it will create exactly the same thing that you get if you say on RStudio export. But I think you can export this PNG. What it really does, RStudio, is it opens this device, runs all your uh, previous printing commands again, and, and just does this in the background for you. There's JPEG TIFF, uh, Windows meta, meta files for Windows, and all kinds of things. There's, if you say question mark devices, you will see there's like lots of devices that you can use to print on. Some devices can do things better than others. For example, uh, in PNGs, you can make things that are translucent, and in other devices, they cannot support translucent things with alpha shading. Um, so you need to figure out which the one is that you want to do. Okay, interactive and advanced graphics. The basic plotting that R uses is 20 years old. So it is very functional, people understand it, it works, but sometimes there is something that you want to do that's visually very pleasing and the regular plotting makes it just really, really awkward and you need 50,000 lines of code with don't do X's and I make my X's manually later and it's really not so much fun. But there's actually several options that you have to do more advanced plotting. And the probably most important one is called ggplot2. There's a book by a visual designer that uh, 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 created this and it's called The Grammar of Graphics. And it really works like a grammar where you have verbs and you put them together and to describe how your visualization is supposed to look like and it will translate that into actual plots. Sounds very eclectic, but if you look at the book that he has, it really makes sense where you say, and then I say, and all my dots or, or, or all my values of, of what could it be, um, of how many people in a certain area commit a crime, I want to encode this by the size of my symbol. And you really can write it like this. Or I want to encode it by the color of my symbol. So it's, it's way more flexible in that way that you can attach a value that you have in your data set to a certain property of your, of your plot. Right? Or I want to have this be represented by the angle of something. And it really uses something that's, that's that way. Um, then Archie Gobi. G Gobi is an interactive system that lets you look at high dimensional data. We know high dimensional data is hard because we can only see something on two dimensions. We can print it, we can do a pseudo three dimensional with perspective, but then we're pretty much done with what we can do. And Argobi basically takes your data and allows you with a slider to look at it from different directions. So it makes different projections and it maybe even calculates a part through different directions and you can visually then see that those three dimensions separate my two groups the best, and that's what it is. Um, iPlots does interactive plots with the iPlot library in Java. Uh, then there's a, function, uh, a package called PlayWith that also lets you interactively explore data, and RGL makes 
three-dimensional and, and, and graphs that you can manipulate using the OpenGL library. I'm pretty sure by now there's more than that, uh, but those are the most important ones. And then one thing that's important is the grid uh, plotting system, which is probably now five years or six years, no, it's probably almost 10 years old, which is a way advanced plotting engine for R that, that allows you to plot several plots and rotate them and do all kinds of things. Um, those two things, you don't really need to like learn how to use them, but you need to realize that some packages might create a plot that is not a basic plot in R, and if you try to like add lines and points with, with, the, with the basic functions, then it just fails. It either doesn't do anything or they are not placed correctly, and that is probably then the case that they either use grid or ggplot, and then you need to look up how do I add points correctly for grid or ggplot to make that work. Okay, I also have here some exercises that you can work on at, at home. Should not be too, too hard and too complicated. Okay, and now since the project is, is up soon, let's go through the R code for the individual plots. And that's chapter three, we did all of this, we did all of this, and we went all the way to visualizations here. And I have, again, histograms. I guess I can just go through those, right? We know how to make histograms. We can use several breaks. We can change the color, and then we see that those bars become gray. This color can actually be a vector. You can give each bar a different color. For example, if I say, instead of gray, it's one through five, then you get this very colorful thing. It basically says color one is black, color two is red. It goes through color five, and then it starts to recycle those colors. It doesn't really makes so much sense. Some people encode the length of the bar again with a color, and, and, but since we are pretty good at, at understanding and seeing what length is, it doesn't really make any, any difference. So a gray one is probably as good as, as one with color. Then we talked about the empirical cumulative distribution function, right? And we can do this in R as well. There's a function that estimates this, and then we can just, for example, take an histogram and add the cumulative distribution function with the lines function. So I take my E that I just calculated up here, I want it in red, and I want to make it a little thicker so it's better to see, and then what you get is this distribution function, right? So that's pretty straightforward. If we look at E itself, then it tells us it's an empirical CDF, and it has those values, which are just basically the values that it plots, plots up here. Okay. Box plot, we talked about box plots, right? And if I give it a data frame, then I get exactly what I probably want, which is for each of my variables, I get a box with the median, right? With the first and third quartile, the interquartile range, and then those viscous are, depending on the definition, 1.5 interquartile ranges away, and if I still have data points there, I get those like outlier points. And we can see that sample length is way larger as a distribution than sepal width. Um, scatter plot. We had a scatter plot. We can use the color here, the species for color. That's I think is not so interesting. Um, the scatter matrix plot that we get when we say plot iris is actually calling internally something called a bears plot, and it's just because it plots scatter plots for each pair of the variable. That's why they call it bears plot. Uh, but it is really a scatter plot matrix, not very, very exciting. There is an alternative for scatter plot matrices, which looks a little cooler, and it's in G pairs, and it uses the GG plot two package, and it looks slightly different. It looks like this. It has a little bit more information. It has those regular scatter plots. But instead of having this just white, they actually put a histogram of the corresponding variable in there. So you get the histogram with the distribution of sepal length, as well as the relationship between sepal length and sepal width as a scatter plot, and between sepal length and battle width as a scatter plot. Uh, and it also realizes that the last variable that we have is actually nominal, and that's why it gives us here this bar chart that says, you know, this is the value, those are the three different values. One thing that I don't like is why it doesn't give us actually here the names, right? It should actually say Setosa versus color, but 
it's not smart enough to figure that out, I guess, at this point. OK, so far so good. It's just a different way to do this visualization. Let's see where we are. We can also make the iris data, at least the first four columns, into a matrix and then to an image. And then we get a plot that's very similar to the one that we had on the slides, right? So we have here our 100, no, in this way we have our 150 flowers. Unfortunately, it says from 0 to 1 here. So it probably would be better to plot this with x, this is false. Because the axes don't really make sense. It goes from one to zero to one, but it should actually go from flower one to flower 150, right? And then here we have our four variables. And it really just takes the values that it has and it decodes them. We know red is the smallest one and white is the largest one since it uses heat colors. And it just knows that this one variable is way uh, uh, larger than the other variables. If we have our axis, does it at least use something reasonable over there? No, it also uses from 0 to 1. So those axes are really not very useful for, uh, for that. If you want axes, you could actually do this and then say axis and probably specify the axis. Axis, let's see what it was, side 1. And what else can I do there? At 1 is probably this, at 1 through 1. Oh, this is, this is going to be hard. <laughs> Sequence from 0 to 1. Lens out 150. And then labels or something. Doesn't make it so much prettier, but at least there are now positions correctly, right? This is flower 1. It goes all the way to flower 150. Uh, there's way too many labels. That's why it, it, it leaves them out. Um, and we can do the same thing to the other side. Side two is this one. So side two, and we have here four. And the labels are, how are our labels called? Length, sepal length. Or we can get it from our data. How can we get those names from our data? Call names, maybe, from Iris. Um, one through four, maybe. Okay. Okay, if you have enough space, so it, it adds now at least those labels. So you see you can create your own axis, but it's a real a big pain to do that. It's not, not fun at all. And I'm actually also not really sure if it shouldn't be the other way around, if that's not supposed to be separate lens. Because image does some weird things where it like, it doesn't represent the matrix as it is, but it like, changes it. I basically hate this plot, but OK. Actually, I do hate this plot because there's a package serration that does a better job. It has a P image, which is called a proper image, because the original image in, 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 in R is so bad. Uh, and I use, again, the iris matrix. And I give it some, some labels here. And then it looks very squished together. But then it looks like this. And then it has. Here, the variables, it tells us what the variable names are. It says those are the objects ordered by species. And then it even tells us some kind of color key that the values go from probably 1 all the way to kind of 7. And, and that tells us way more than the original image, image did. And that's why it's a proper image, right? Um, you can do things. What did we have in our slides? I think that they calculated the standardized value, right? And then compared those. So they subtracted the mean. and and divided by the standard deviation, which is what scale does. And we can do this as well here. And then it looks like this, the proper image, which has now 0, which is the mean for each variable. So everything that's like grayish is exactly the mean of that one variable. And if it's too small, it's going to be bluish. If it's too large, it's going to be more reddish. And you can see there's three classes of flowers, right? Those one have two large petal width and petal lengths. Uh, and two short, uh, those one have two short battle lengths. So it, it just shows you the standardized differences. And it uses this very subtle color, right? And the reason is this color is corrected for perception, which means that 
a blue of a certain level corresponds exactly to the intensity of the red of that same level and you don't get kind of confused that one color is stronger than the other in the appearance. Okay, so far so good. Correlation matrix. Of course we can do a correlation matrix as well. And correlation goes from minus one to plus one, right? We know this from minus one to plus one. It gives us even a color key here. It has all the variables via all the other variables and it tells us which one is more correlated to each other. And we already know which ones are very correlated, which is each variable with itself, right? So this point, this point, this point, that's the highest value that you can get. But you also see that petal width and sepal width are negatively correlated, right? Larger petal width means smaller petal uh, sepal width. So that's a very interesting thing. If you have something in your data set where you can calculate a correlation, that would be a way you can, can visualize that. Um, there is also correlation plots. They look like this. They're made to visualize the same thing. Uh, and the idea here is that those ellipses tell you if there's a correlation. If it's a line like this, then it means it's a perfect correlation. The reason is this is supposed to kind of like be a mock image of the scatter plot. If in your scatter plot everything is on this line here, then you have perfect correlation, right? If on your scatter plot everything is in a circle like this, then there's no correlation whatsoever, right? And if it's actually closer to a line like this, then you have negative correlation. So that's the idea here, and they also encode correlation here with different, with different colors. Test for correlation, I think we did that. There's just a statistical test for that. Correlation between objects, we can do that. Correlation between objects, now we have 150 objects by 150 objects. Look at the correlation between them, and we see those are highly correlated. Those are highly correlated and in between there, they are like close to like a little bit correlated because they're all irises, so it would be weird if they're not correlated, right? But not as strong as within, within the groups. Parallel correlated plot, you can use this as well. <coughs> and that's really directly taken from <coughs> what we had in our slides. It just uses each variable as one of the coordinates and just plots the individual, individual flowers as lines connecting those points. You can reorder those. And then they're in a different order. Supposed to make it easier for you to detect that this blue, this black ones are very different from the other two ones. If you have more variables, this reordering has maybe a better, better, bigger influence, um, but it's supposed to make more ple pleasant um, visualizations. And that's pretty much it, right? So you can use all those. Uh, maybe, I think it's not in there. If you have a normal variable, right? Let's say you have the variable sex and it's, it's male, male, female, and another female, right? Histogram, and you, you probably actually, if it's in a data frame, you will get it as a factor. So it will more look like this. And if you say histogram sex, then that doesn't work, right? So you probably have to first make it into a numeric and then you get something that's, I think I just messed up my device. That's the problem here. Let's try it again. Yes, that's what it is. Okay, since we have the same frequency, it looks kind of like this. But it's not awesome because it has those numbers down here. I really would like it to say male and female, right? So how do you get that? Does anybody know how to do that? You do table, then it gives you a table, and then you plot the table with a bar plot. Bar, okay, plot. And then you get what you probably are looking for, which is it uses the correct labels here, and it has those bars. So don't abuse histogram. It's not meant for nominal variables at all. Use a bar plot for that. Okay. That's pretty much it. I think at this point you should be able to do all kinds of plots. There is one website, maybe let's put that, that might help you here if you see, see it says R Graph Gallery. And there you can actually look at different data types and how they can be visualized, for example, heat map. And then they will give you tons of examples and you can just pick one and say, oh, 
I want you know visualize my data on a map. How did they do that? And you can just copy paste code from here, um, and use this in your own graphs. And there's thousands of different visualizations where you have actually the code for in this on this website. So it makes sense to look at at this one.